even as we prepared for service and was in here, I heard a couple of sirens go down the road. And yeah, the fire department or something. I seen one of the fire trucks that <coughs> coming over here. I'm not sure what it was. <laughs> yeah, but I seen a fire truck up at BP gas enough for come back in here. But I thought about. And it probably was a fire truck or something, but it's funny how sometimes the Lord uses things like that to stir your spirit because I thought when I heard that, and here we were getting ready to have service, I couldn't help but think about our brothers and sisters that are over there in the countries where they are persecuted and where they have to meet secretly, where we have the freedom to meet openly, they don't have that freedom. And I couldn't help but think about how it must feel for them to gather together somewhere to share a scripture or to share their time of prayer in secrecy, the kind of feeling they must have if they hear a siren in the distance. And you're coming to get them, huh? Coming to get them. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I had a lump swell up in my throat mm -hmm. as I thought about yeah. the freedom that we have and the freedom that they don't have and how it is taken so much for granted today that many people just rode over in the bed and went on back to sleep or maybe they went fishing this morning or maybe they had something better to do because they thought, well, I'll go to church next week or I'll go to church tonight or I'll go to church some other time. None of us are promised to have that freedom forever. I realize we take for granted that we live in America and that we're always going to be free, but if you have any eyesight at all, you can see that our freedoms are gradually, slowly, yes, but surely being taken away little by little. And before we get out of here, it might get a whole lot worse here than it is now, and it may be like it is over there. We might wind up having to meet somewhere in secret and uh, spend a time of prayer. I want to go this morning to the book of Romans, the first chapter, and we're going to be talking about the Apostle Paul. And I try not to hold you too long, but I'd be lying to you if I told you I didn't feel this, the preacher coming on this morning. Hallelujah. As I sat at the desk last night and I fed upon God's Word and He began to stir my soul and bless my spirit. and Hallelujah. I want to talk about the Apostle Paul in Romans the first chapter. We're going to start at the 13th verse. But, once I want, but first I want you to realize uh, who he's writing to here. Now we know that the letters that Paul wrote, he wrote... <coughs> Some letters to the church at Corinth. He wrote some letters to the church of, of uh, Ephesia. He wrote some church, some letters to the churches there in Galatia. And so Paul is writing here, and he's writing to the church in Rome. And it's important to know that he's writing to the church in Rome in order to be able to understand the context in which Paul was putting this. Now he could have made these statements to some of his brethren at Corinth and they would not have had any they wouldn't have been surprised because they had worked elbow to elbow with Paul there in Corinth and they had heard him preach and they had seen him work and the fruit of the spirit through his life but here we find Paul writing to a church the church that is in the very headquarters of the Roman Empire some writers put it this way the seat of Satan of that day because this is where most of the persecution, it's certainly a lot, the worst of it took place there, but all of the persecution that was taking place against the church in other places, you, it could be traced back to Rome and the official orders of the Roman Empire to stamp out Christianity and the threat that they felt that these Jesus people made to them. So here we find the Apostle Paul writing a letter to the church of Rome, and this is not just any other place. Like I said, it was the Roman Empire's headquarters of that day, the seat of of Satan, if you will, the very persecutors of the church, the people that Paul at one time worked for. Amen? The people that Paul one time was on the same side as the Roman Empire. He wanted to get rid of all the Christians. Mm -hmm. He was religious. Mm -hmm. He believed in God. He believed that these Jesus people were a threat to his religion. Mm -hmm. He believed that these, pe these Jesus people were a threat to what he believed. So anyway... He's writing to the church of Rome. We're going to pick this up in the 13th verse of the first chapter of the book of Rome, uh, Romans. And he says, Now, I would not have you ignorant. Listen to what he's telling them. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. He was saying, I don't want you to be ignorant about this fact. 
There may have been some rumors going around that Paul won't come here to preach to us because he's scared to come to Rome. He's afraid to come to Rome, which like I said, is the very pinnacle of the persecution of the church. And he said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning this. I've wanted to come to you. But there have been things that have kept me from coming to you. And maybe he said, maybe the Lord had him somewhere else and had him doing another work. Maybe Satan himself was hindering Paul's journey or his route to Rome and, and putting up obstacles to keep him from getting there. But Paul said, I don't want you to be ignorant. It's got nothing to do with fear. It's got nothing to do with me not wanting to come there. He goes on to say, I am debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as is in me, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. He said, as much as I want to be there, I want to come. I'm not afraid for my life. And we've seen that in all of Paul's journeys. He wasn't afraid for his life. Whenever he had his experience on the road to Damascus, this man was changed. I'm talking about changed. Amen. This man that would once would have given his life for the cause of religion and, the, and his faith that, that to kill these Christians now would give his life for Christ. And he's telling the church at Rome. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning this. With everything that is in my being, I want to come and preach the gospel to you. I'm ready. Regardless of the fact that this is the headquarters of the Roman Empire. Regardless of the fact that I'll be putting my life in more danger than I'm already in if I come into Rome and begin to preach to you. Then he makes this proclamation, Brother Rodney. Something I wish today we could get the church to stand on the rooftops and shout. Paul, speaking to the church in Rome, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I want to come. There's been things that's hindered me. And with everything within me, I want to come and preach the gospel in Rome. I want to stand with you right there in the very headquarters of the devil and preach the gospel to the people of Rome. Then he makes this bold proclamation in the 16th verse. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Did you hear that? <laughs> I'm not ashamed. Listen, it's not because of fear that I haven't come to you. I don't want you to believe it's because I'm afraid, but I also don't want you to believe that it's because I'm ashamed of the faith that I have in Christ and this experience that I've had with Jesus Christ, the crucified one. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Gentiles. Even though I know that if I come there, the penalty might be death. This man knew the penalty better than most because he used to carry it out. Yeah. He used to pack letters in his pocket with orders. And if anybody tried to stop him, he'd say, listen, I've got orders right here to kill every Christian I can get my hands on. I've got orders right here to take every one of them back to be persecuted and to be killed. This man knew the penalty. He knew the hatred of the Roman Empire toward the Christian community. He knew the hatred of these religious and, and, and the, these people who, who, who believed that the, the, the faith of Jesus, the, people, the people that had the faith in Jesus Christ. I get it out in a minute. See, I'm not ashamed either. Amen? I don't care whether the devil likes it or not. We are going to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, tongue-tied or not tongue-tied. I might have to write it down and done some sign language, but we're going to preach the gospel of Jesus. And that's what Paul was saying. I know that they are religious. I know that they are dogmatic in the fact that they're going to kill as many of us as they can get their hands on. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. And even though I know the penalty might be great for coming there, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I refuse to stand before men and deny this Jesus that I have met. I guarantee you, all of these men of God, from Peter down to Paul, all the way to John the Revelator, had an opportunity to stand before the leaders of that day and either denounce their faith in Christ and live or to proclaim their faith in Christ and be put to death. They crucified Peter. They beheaded many of the apostles. They beheaded Paul. He went to Nero's chop block. Why? Because he would not deny Jesus. My goodness, we have people today that don't know what they're going to do because somebody came against them on Facebook. Amen. They didn't stand in front of a king saying, listen, you're either going to, you're going to denounce this Jesus or you're going to be put to death. 
But somebody just ridiculed them on Facebook and oh, it's terrible. Their world is turned upside down. Well, they can ridicule me on Facebook all they want. Amen. Hallelujah. They can. The best thing for them to do, if they don't want to hear about Jesus, is take me off their buddy list. Amen. Because I can't, and that's what Paul was telling them. If I don't care if the Romans don't want to hear about Jesus, they can take me off their buddy list. Amen. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We need some people today that are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Even though I know this is the very seat of Satan, I am more than willing. I am. I have a desire to come to the Roman people and preach the gospel. David would put it this way in Psalms the 107th chapter in the first verse. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That's verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We need some Christians today that are willing to have enough backbone to stand before a world that is ungodly and on its way to hell and say I believe in Jesus Christ. Not that he is one of the ways. Not that he stands shoulder to shoulder or neck and neck with Muhammad or Allah but he's above all the rest because he is the way the truth and the life and there is no other way other than through him other than through him there is no other way that's what Paul was saying I'm not ashamed if Paul had have been here in the year of 2011 and Larry King had have asked him to come on his television show <laughs> Paul would not have been ashamed, Brother Sleese, to sit there in front of a worldwide audience and whenever asked the question, well, is Christ the only way? Paul would not have sidestepped. He wouldn't have done no stutter step. He wouldn't have done no shuffle. He would have said, Jesus Christ is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And no man can get to heaven except through Him. Oh, but not the big preachers we have today. <clears throat> they want to try to make everybody feel included. They want, they want to preach the gospel of inclusion. Why? Because they're ashamed of the gospel of Christ. If they were not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, they would boldly proclaim as they stood before their congregation of thousands, as they stood before their television cameras, they would proclaim that Jesus Christ is the only way. And following Muhammad will take you to hell. Praying to Allah will take you to hell. Believing in any other God other than Jesus Christ will take you to hell because He is the only way. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul was telling them. That's what we need today. We need a church that is bold enough to proclaim Jesus not just inside their four walls on their padded pew and their carpeted room and their chandeliers, not just that, that are willing to come into church and lift up their voice in praise, but are willing to walk the streets, amen, and be a witness for Jesus Christ and not be ashamed of the gospel. That's what Paul said. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. We need some church folks like that. Amen. We need some people. We got a lot of undercover Christians. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about they in deep undercover. Amen. Yeah. Amen. You ever seen sometimes, you know, you hear stories or maybe you watch a cop show and they'll send somebody in. Now you're going to be deep. Ain't nobody going to know you're a cop but me and you. But well, sometimes I wonder if only people know you a Christian is you and God. Amen. Because you in such deep cover, ain't nobody else got no idea you even go to church, let alone know Jesus. Amen. Yeah. We need some people that'll be bold enough to proclaim I'm one of them. Amen. Instead, most of the time, we're like Peter. Before he got filled with the Holy Ghost, and he's following Jesus to the trial, and the little woman says, you're one of them. He says, oh, no, I ain't. Amen. Oh, no, I ain't. That's the way it is a lot of times with us. They'll say, you're one of them. We'll do everything we can to prove that we ain't. Amen. Oh, I ain't one of them. Oh, my mama was a holy roller, but I'm not. I'm not. You know, I was raised that way, but I've learned better. Yeah, you've learned better, all right. Now you're ashamed of the very gospel that saved you. That's the power of God. Yeah, you're one of them. That's what we need. We need some shirts printed up that says, I'm one of them. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Put Jesus on the back yeah. or something, but I am one of them. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm a tongue-talking holy roller. I believe Jesus Christ is God. Amen. Yeah. He is the only way to heaven today. Mm -hmm. I'm one of them. Hallelujah. I told you I felt the preacher coming on. Uh -huh. Now would be a good time for me to throw in this scripture before we move on. Mark 8 and 38. Jesus speaking, he says, Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, 
of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That don't sound very promising for most Christians today. For most of the undercover people today that are ashamed. I'm reminded of a story, and this is a silly one, about a lumberjack that came down out of the hills and went to a camp meeting. The preacher was having, we'll say he was Pentecostal. <laughs> Maybe in Baptist. He preached and the lumberjack got saved, gloriously born again. And the preacher said, you know, let's all pray for him because he got to go back up there to the, his job and it ain't going to be easy on him. So he leaves. Comes back six months later and the preacher's there. And the guy comes in and he's all, you know, he's all smiles and all happy. And the preacher says, well, tell us, testify. We know it had to be hard. We know that you had to face some opposition. We know that you've been going through some stuff. And he said, well, not really. He said, well, what did they say when they found out you was born again? I just didn't tell them. He said, Amen. I just didn't tell them. They didn't know it. That's what it is most of the time anymore. Amen. They don't know it. They don't know that you know Jesus. They don't know that you've been born again because you're keeping it hid. On Monday morning, you tell the same jokes they tell. On Monday morning, you laugh at the same jokes that they laugh at. On Monday morning, on Saturday night, you're in the same places where they're at. Amen? So they don't know that anything different has happened to you. You're like Lot. Your spirit has done become so vast, you're just one of the boys. Amen? You've just blended in so much. Instead of your light shining to them, they have all but put your light out. Amen? And you've become ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So ashamed, you won't let your light shine before men. We need to be like those people over there in the book of Acts. Whenever they went in, the Bible says they drug him out of the house of Jason. They took him before the rulers. And they said in Acts 17 and 6, talking about these Christians, these, they that have turned the world upside down are come here also, have come hither also. Amen? Those that have been causing such a ruckus over there, oh no, they came here now. Now they're preaching over here. <laughs> how many times has anybody ever looked at you and thought, oh no. Here comes that Jesus guy. Yeah. Amen. Here comes Sleece. I know he's going to be talking about Jesus. Amen. He's been stirring things up over there. He's going to come over here and stir stuff up. We need some people that will stir stuff up. Amen. We need more people going against the flow instead of flowing right along with the flow heading toward hell. Amen. We need somebody that will swim against the tide. We need Christians that will stand up in these last days and boldly, and, and boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. The only way to get to heaven and that we're not ashamed of the gospel. Amen? Not ashamed of the gospel. And listen, you may, you may think you're getting by now with your undercover work. Amen? But sooner or later, you're going to be faced with a choice. You're either going to have to fish or cut bait, as the old folks used to say. I'm not sure what that means. But the old folks used to say it and it worked for them. <laughs> you're either going to have to get a pole and do some fishing or sit back there and get the bait ready or something. I don't know. You're either going to have to proclaim you're a Christian or you're going to deny Him in front of man. Amen. We talk about Peter because Peter denied Him with his mouth. But oh, listen to me. Many, many people will deny Him this week with their actions. Amen. Actions speak louder than words, my friend. Amen. You can tell me on Sunday morning how much a Christian you are and how much you love God. And then I see you the next day cussing a blue streak and don't even act like you know Jesus. Who you think you're fooling? Must be fooling yourself because you ain't fooling nobody else. Amen? I guarantee you, you ain't fooling too many of the people of the world because they know what you are. They can tell by the fruit that you bear. Amen? They can tell what kind of limb it is because the fruit that it's bringing forth will, will tell you, will confess to you what kind of tree it's connected to. Amen. If we find a branch out here today freshly blown off of a tree and it's covered in apples, we don't have to wonder, well, wonder if this here limb fell off of a pear tree. No, it came from an apple tree because the branch will bring forth the fruit of the tree that it's connected to. The same way with us. Amen. Jesus said, if I abide in you and you in me, I'm the vine and you're the branch, you will bear fruit of who? Of Him. Because the branch cannot bear fruit of its own self. It must be connected to a power source 
to a life source. Mm -hmm. It must be connected to a life source in order to bring forth fruit. Mm -hmm. Go out and find you a fruit-bearing tree today, whether it's apple, whether it's pear, whatever it is. Cut a limb off of it and lay that limb in your yard and wait for it to grow apples. It ain't going to happen because it's been separated from the life source. Amen? Amen. It ain't going to happen with you either if you've separated yourself from the tree. Amen? From Jesus Christ. And we do that by being ashamed of His gospel, ashamed of His name. And when He comes, the Bible says that in the presence of the Father and the angels, He will be ashamed of us because we... And you may think you're getting by. And I'm not trying to judge you this morning, but I can't promise you that you won't be one of those that the Bible says He looks at and says, Depart from me, you wicked and slothful and unfaithful servant. Amen? And not one of those He says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come on into life. Amen? If you but continue to... To live your Christian life undercover with no witness whatsoever, you're going to wind up like a lot. You're going to be vexed. Amen. And we find people all through the Bible who were not ashamed of their relationship with God. Amen. Talking about not being ashamed of the gospel today. Amen. Trying to hurry up. <clears throat> Talked about Peter. How that he was ashamed. He was afraid. They had already taken Jesus. They had Him before the council. Mm -hmm. yeah. And no doubt all of them were saying they're going to crucify Him. Well, yeah. They're going to kill Him. Mm -hmm. They're going to crucify Him. So here they find Peter. And listen, Peter had spent some time, a lot of time with Jesus. Enough time that people knew He was one of them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. The maid, as she finds Him there warming Himself by the fire, she said, you're one of them. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Peter said, whoa, wait a minute. What? I, he wasn't saying nothing. He wasn't doing nothing. He's just sitting there. And the maid says, yep. you're one of them. I can tell. You've been spending time with him. Listen, whoever you spend time with rubs off on you. Amen. Amen. You can think that you can rub elbows with the devil and still come out smelling good if you won't work. If you get in the hog pen and play with the hogs, you're going to smell like a hog. Amen. Peter had been spending time with Jesus and you can tell that's what we need today. We need some people that we can look at and say, oh, I know they just came from the prayer closet. I can tell by the countenance on their face that they've been spending time in the presence of God. But you can't usually tell that. We need to be able to tell that. You remember whenever Moses came down from the mount, he'd been in the presence of God, they had to put a veil over his face because his face shone so bright they couldn't look on him. They could tell by looking that he'd been in the presence of God. They could tell by Peter's, by the way Peter, Peter acted, the way Peter looked, they could tell that he had been spending time with Jesus. Amen? We need some people today that get so wrapped up, tied up, tangled all up in Jesus. We need some of them people they used to call, you know, that's one of them Jesus fanatics. That's one of them Jesus people, you know, and that's what we need. We need more Jesus people. Amen? We need more fanatics. We need less football fanatics and more Jesus fanatics. We need less basketball fanatics and more Jesus fanatics. We need some people that will get a hold of God and spend some time in His presence. That way whenever they go out and somebody sees them and they know they need help and they know they need prayer, they'll run up to you because they know you've got a relationship with God. That's why they used to do granny. Amen. Oh, they talk about her and run her down and they'd say, you know, she's an old fogey and she don't believe in nothing and, and she's, you know, everything's a sin and all of that. But the minute they got sick, somebody say, oh, go get granny. Have her come pray for me. Tell granny to come over here and lay hands on me and pray for me. Anoint me with all. Why? Because they knew Granny had spent time with Jesus. She wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. She wasn't ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What kind of God is it that you're serving? If you're ashamed to let people know that you serve Him, something bad wrong with that picture. And Paul was telling the people of Rome, I'm not ashamed. And listen, I know today and there are people out there under the sound of my voice, preachers, that as you got ready for church this morning, you turned on Christian television, and I use that word loosely. Yeah. And you tried to channel surf through the Christian networks and find somebody somewhere that was preaching something. Amen? Something other than every day can be Friday and your best life now. And you get a good thought, I'll get a good thought, we'll all think good together and everything will grow roses. Amen. You tried to find something and as you watch this putrid, ignorant doctrine that they teach, tears well up in your eyes and you wonder, God, 
Is there anybody left? Oh, I want to encourage you this morning. God has got a remnant of people today just like He always has. Do you remember? And I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's alright. I'm about done anyway. Do you remember whenever Elijah was being chased by Jezebel and he went up there and he got on the mountain and he hid in the cave and the Spirit of the Lord come to him, Brother Tyler, and he said, Elijah, what doest thou here? What are you doing hidden in this cave? This same man that stood before the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel and declared that God was God and there was no other, now when faced with this witch, Jezebel, tucks tail and runs the other way. Amen? And God says, what are you doing? And Elijah drags his sorry tail out of the cave and he stands out there and he says, I'm the only one left. There's nobody else serving God. Everybody else has denied you. And oh, you know what God's response was to that? He said, I've got a remnant. How many people did he say he had? Let me find it. How many people did he say he had? <clears throat> oh, it's in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. This is what Elijah said. He said, I've been very jealous of the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel had forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. Did you hear that? He felt like he's the only one. Do you feel like that today? Do you feel like you're the only one that's living? Do you feel like you're the only one on your block that don't have a pumpkin with a carved out face sitting on their front porch and some witches hanging from the porch and, and some ghosts hanging in your trees out front? Do you feel like you're the only one that hasn't given in to the, to the witchcraft and the occult that has taken over your neighborhood? Everywhere you look, there's tombstones and there's cobwebs and there's witches and there's goblins and there's ghosts. Do you feel like you're the only one today that has not succumbed to the spirit of witchcraft? witchcraft that has bewitched the church though she's so ignorant she can't recognize a witch from a prophet of from a prophet of God? Do you feel like today you become the only one today that's standing for anything? I was watching a preacher on YouTube the other night. I can tell you his name. I can tell you where he was preaching, but he ain't going to do it. He's up there preaching and he's got me fired up and I'm really thinking he's doing great. And he says, I do not celebrate Halloween. And I thought, glory to God, there's another one of us. Amen. And just then he said, even though I don't celebrate it, my son wanted to go to a haunted house, so I went with him. I turned him off pretty quick after that, Brother Tyler. Amen. Preachers so spiritually stupid that they don't understand the danger of delving into the occult with their children. He said, I don't believe in celebrating it, but we went to a haunted house. And then he went on to use his experience at this haunted house as the focal point of his sermon. And you know what I thought? It grieved me. I didn't take no joy in it. But I thought, dummy, 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 dummy. Amen. Do you feel like you're the only one out there? This is the way Elijah felt up there on the mountain. Uh, God's response, four verses down, says this. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel. This is 1 Kings 19 and 18. I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal. And every mouth which hath not kissed him. God still got some people that are not willing to bow their knee to Baal. God still got some people, Brother Sleese, a remnant that are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has still got some people today that are willing to boldly proclaim, I will not, I shall, I cannot deny the name of the one that saved me, sanctified me, washed me in his blood and brought me up out of the miry clay and set my feet on a rock. I am not ashamed today of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God and the salvation. There is no other way today other than the old rugged cross. So he tells Elijah, Brother Rodney, he says, I've got a remnant. They have not became ashamed of me. And God's still got a remnant. We find Paul proclaiming this scripture in Romans, the book we're reading out of, the 11th chapter. And listen to what he says. Can I read it? Thank you. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Then he asked him, Don't you remember the scripture that Elijah said? How he made intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed the prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. Paul goes on to say, 
But what, in, what 